Now we're starting our unit seven, which is on cognition. So it has pretty much everything to do with anything past learning, which is memory, um, encoding memory, storing memory, forgetting things, but then problem solving as well and language. And we're gonna talk about all of those things. In this set of notes, we're just going to introduce the idea of memory and talk about the process of um, what memory looks like and, and how we are able to, to use it. So let's do kind of a very broad overview, um, an introduction to memory here. Memory being the basis of knowing your friends, knowing who your neighbors are, the English language, the national anthem, but also yourself, right? And that you can remember past instances and those are stored in your brain. If there was no memory, everyone would be a stranger to you. Every language foreign, every task new, and even you yourself would be a stranger. Memory is any indication that learning has persisted over time. So we just finished our unit six on learning and how we learn. And then in unit seven, we're talking about how our learning can persist and how it makes a long-term effect on us. It is our ability to store and then retrieve information. And there's a lot of complicated processes with that. So think about your memories. Um, write down as many concepts or ideas that come to mind when I say the word yellow. So what do you think of when you think of the word yellow? Um, one idea might lead to another like, oh, the sun. Oh, well, the sun and yellow flowers because the sun and flowers have something to do with each other and um, maybe a yellow umbrella. Like it's all kind of leads one to the other and that's the stream of consciousness or spread of activation. And that one thing that you think of makes you then think of another thing, which makes you then think of another thing. And that's because our neurons that are activated in our memories are linked to things similar to it and therefore trigger those neurons better. Um, what did you do on your fifth birthday? Or describe the events that occurred the last time you went to a restaurant. Okay, these are all memories that you might have. You probably would reconstruct your memory and kind of think about it, right? Like, okay, my fifth birthday, maybe that was a little long ago. So what about your 16th birthday, let's say? What'd you do for that? And then who is this character here that's on the slide? Hopefully you understand that that's Darth Vader. Um, notice that we have very similar memories, like who this character is, and that would be a semantic memory because it has a, it's a memory of meaning, and that this picture represents Darth Vader. That's a meaning, right? As a dark, shadowy, evil character. But we also have very individual, unique ones, like what you did on your fifth birthday or what happened at your last restaurant, and those being episodic memories. And we're going to talk about all these types of memories, but this just kind of gets you thinking about the different types of memories we have. One being a flashbulb memory. It's a unique and highly emotional moment that gives rise to clear, strong, and persistent memory, being called a flashbulb memory. It's not free from errors meaning these memories are very likely to be wrong, to be erroneous, um, because they are so emotional and not necessarily objective. So 9-11 is very much a flashbulb memory for people of my generation and, and older, um, because we were of conscious age to remember exactly where we were when it happened. Um, for people in, like my parents' generation, understanding where they were when like, or even my grandparents, um, what was going on with JFK was assassinated or Martin Luther King Jr., right? And that they, they remember those. But we can also have very individual flashbulb memories, like just thinking of a more traumatic event in your life might make you kind of like have to get your bearings and deal with that emotion because it's so strongly tied and is such a vivid memory. So let's talk about the stages of memory, okay? So stages of memory, and we're gonna use an analogy for a computer, okay? So we have encoding, storage, and retrieval, and we actually have separate sets of notes for each of these stages of memory. Know that it is a sequential process, that you have to encode the information first, store it, and then retrieve it. Encoding is the process of getting the information into your brain. So um, let's say that someone just sent you a text message, okay? You don't chisel your brain, right, and open it up and put the message into your brain and close it back up 
in order to understand what the message is saying. No, it's not what you do. Your sensory receptors in your eyes, right, communicate to your brain and your Wernicke's area and probably your Broca's too to understand what all is going on so that you can then respond to the message. Your eyes essentially change this message into language that is then understood. Okay, that's encoding. And then you, well, and just to go with our, our computer analogy, that might be the keyboard, right? Like you don't open up your keyboard and put a piece of paper in it to say, this is what I want you to know, computer. No, that's not what you do. You type into the computer because then your computer can understand what you're wanting it to do. Storage, yes, you store memories. You don't actively have a memory of the last grade you got on your last exam although now you're probably thinking of it, right? Um, but you aren't thinking about that all the time. You just store it and you access it when you need it. That's kind of like a flash drive or even the hard drive on your computer. You're not always using it, right? But it's there. And then retrieval is when you are actively thinking of something and want to gain access to it and use it in your environment somehow and you're thinking right and this would be like the monitor like say you go into your folders and you open a folder you have now accessed or retrieved that information all three processes must occur to remember and subsequently to learn you have to go through all three of these now information processes is also kind of a three-step thing and this is just where our memories are okay atkinson and schifrin in 1968 came up with this three-stage model of memory which includes sensory memory short-term memory and long-term memory okay and this involves the process of encoding storage and retrieval okay so we have external events going on right and our sensory memory is one, and we're gonna describe all of these very quickly, that kind of sifts through everything that's going on and says you should pay attention to this, but you shouldn't pay attention to other things, okay? And then short-term memory and long-term memory we're gonna talk about a little more. So sensory memory is the initial momentary storage of information and it lasts only an instance, like a second or two. Think about all the things that are going on in your environment right now. There's so many things going on, even though most of them are very minuscule. We use our senses to take in this information, right? So it, our sensory memory says you shouldn't pay attention to the color of the walls right now because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. What you should pay attention to is probably what's going on in your notes or if your mom is yelling for you and wants your attention, right? It allows us to take in all the info and decide if it's important enough for us to pay attention. If the info is not passed on, it is lost. This is called decay or displacement. So think of a sensory memory like a snapshot, but a snapshot that is constantly replaced with new snapshots. Unless it's paid attention to and transferred short-term memory, it goes away. An example of sensory memory would be kind of like a sparkler. When you twirl it, does it actually make a circle or a heart? No, um, but it lasts for just a brief moment where you can kind of connect the sparklers and make sense of the image. Short-term memory <clears throat> is memory that holds meaningful information for a short period of time, longer than sensory memory but not very long at all. It usually lasts about 30 seconds. It has a limited capacity of seven plus or minus two items. And you can store more information in this if you chunk the information, meaning if you group it. And here's an example of all these big long letters that you're like, wow, this is too much information for me to remember all of those. However, if you chunk them into little groups, PBS, Fox, CNN, ABC, CBS, MTV, NBC, you can probably recall all of those. You can get more into your short-term memory and therefore rehearse them more and get them into your long-term memory. So information will leave the short-term memory if it's not being rehearsed, which is repetition or repeating of the information. Think about when you have to look up a number in a phone book. So this is before we had our phones that memorized all of our phone numbers for us and we just click go and it calls someone. You have to keep, or let's say like you forget your phone one day, but you want this really pretty girl's phone number or this really cute boy's phone number. 
um, but you don't have anything to write it down. So you say, okay, give me your number and I'm gonna repeat it to myself over and over again until I remember it. You have to keep repeating it until you dial it or write it down. But if you don't keep repeating it, you're going to forget. This is the process of short-term memory. Rehearsal, repeating, will keep information in short-term memory and is necessary for info to be transferred to long-term memory. So when you're sitting here receiving these notes, repeating these things back to yourself by saying them out loud or even writing them down is going to help you transfer it into your long-term memory better. So the final process being long-term memory. This is memory that stores information on a relatively permanent basis and that your long-term memory is limitless. It has no limit, right? It appears to have a limitless capacity. You can store everything in there. You really can. It's just a matter of, are you really getting the information in there and truly understanding it? And are you keeping it in there? So info and long-term memory is filed and coded so we can retrieve it when needed. And that we have certain things that allow us to remember things and retrieve things from our long-term memory and those being called cues. So problems with this model, there are some problems. Some information skips the first two stages and then turns long-term memory automatically, which we'll talk about what that is. Um, and since we cannot focus on all the sensory information in the environment, we select information through attention that is important to us. And this process is known as selective attention. Um, and that if you're watching a really great TV show, you're probably not gonna hear your mom trying to talk to you about what you're doing after school tomorrow. You're just not going to hear, not because you're consciously saying I'm not paying attention to you, um, although that can be what selective attention is. You say, I'm blocking you out right now. That's selective attention too. And then the nature of short-term memory is more complex. And so that's why Badly came up with the working memory. He proposed that a working memory and it acts as an active workspace in which information is retrieved, manipulated, and maintained through rehearsal instead of the simpler short-term memory described earlier. It's a central executive containing auditory and visual processing, which makes decisions and reasons. It does all of these things. It allows us to briefly maintain info in an active state so we can do something with the information. And that if we do something with that information, it's going to be uh, more solidly stable in our long-term memory.